Captain. Marchant, got it. Marchant, how are you? Doing well. Uh, do you mind if I record this also just for my notes? Not at all. Awesome. Yeah, actually, that might um, even help me if, if okay. I was going to say, if you could share yours with me, that'll get better audio on both of our ends. So yeah. that might be that might be great. Yeah. Excellent. 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 Where are you located? You, uh, I am in just north of Indianapolis. Okay. Yeah. 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 How about you? Uh, Kansas City area. Yeah. Yeah. So are you a, are you a teacher? I am. Yes. Okay. Um, I. My job is kind of weird. Um, I sort of made my own <laughs> job. So my background is I started out as, as a, an English teacher in the middle school. Yeah. Uh, and then I went to uh, school for graduate school for library science mm. and was kind of moving toward uh, working in archives and conservation. Yeah. And um, a job opened up in our school uh, in the library, and so I took it. And then I sort of I moved into the high school probably six or so years ago, and uh, from there I kind of tried to reimagine <laughs> what that space could be. So I have a uh, I have a space we call the Idea Farm, where students come in and we work together building. I teach a class called Innovation by Design. Mm. Um, or try to do uh, design thinking and try to try to have them solve more real world relevant problems. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and and that sort of thing. So yeah, yeah. Um, is that in that space that you're in? As far as because we we position our work, we, we also run Steam camps and we talk about solving pressing world world issues, not just uh, playing around, but actually connecting to to real applications. Is, do you think there's a lot of good work going on in that space or not really? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I mean, it, it's funny that like for some students, it's really like uh, the students that I end up with, it, it's a, you end up with a lot of just introducing the idea of uh, thinking with your hands is what I always call it, Yeah. Um, which I think is a in some ways a completely new way of doing things for them. Yep. So I feel like we spend a, a lot of time um, just sort of <laughs> reimagining what it, what that can look like. Um, but yeah, I do. I, th I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of interest, a lot of, uh, a lot of the folks who I'm connected with kind of around the country are, are very interested in a, a, a more, what I would call a more authentic, Mm -hmm. engagement with yeah so. have you have you ever given thought because because the thing we're trying to kick off like um we're trying to see if we could do that next year actually i'm looking at going to the national association of independent schools conference next year have you have you heard of that thing or no uh -uh. okay um but uh we're looking to, to spawn this collaborative we call it open source ecology classroom but basically a, a thing where all the different teams from all the different schools work together on projects. So really focusing on the collaborative design aspect. Have you thought along those lines ever? Like how, how would you uh, work with others? Because for us it's about, okay, well let's work with all these kids, all these different schools, but create real things, like real products that come out of it. How about a, yeah. like, a, like a renewable energy car or something like that or yeah. whatever. Kind of like FIRST Robotics but with more uh, benign goods, things that yeah. are usable goods. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, I would be very interested in something like that. I, I have thought uh, often yeah. about that. I, I actually connected with a teacher over the summer. I do a lot of um, a lot of teacher training and, and things like that. And so I participated in this thing that we call the Maker Educator Boot Camp over the summer and connected with a, a teacher in Chicago who teaches coding through music making mm -hmm. uh, with this thing called Ear Sketch. So we've talked about uh, having our students collaborate on things like that. Uh, I have a friend who's out in Connecticut and she does engineering design. Um, so we've considered doing some some collaborative pieces there as well. So hmm. yeah, but yeah, I, lo I love that idea. Huh. What's the Maker Educator, Educator Bootcamp? So I'm part of a, of a group called the Maker Educator Collective. And we are uh, researchers, educators, um, museum um, 
officials, you know, kind of a broad range of, of people around the country. And um, basically our goal is just to get more teachers involved in making, yeah. uh, making stuff in, in their classrooms. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so the boot camp is a, is a program that we've run. This was our third year this year. It's uh, put on by the Infosys pa uh, Foundation at uh, IU Bloomington. Um, so basically we have mm, approximately 70 or so teachers from around the country who come in and, and we sort of train them on, you know, uh, different tools, ideas, you know, things like that. So hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Was, the, was the foundation name? The uh, Infosys. Infosys Foundation. Infosys yeah. Foundation. Huh. I'm looking at a major maker education boot camp. Yeah, I found something online. It's yep. August six to nine last year. That was not not this year. Mm. Yeah. No, ours is usually in July, like July twenty seventh to twenty ninth. So this yeah. is called Maker Education Maker Educator Boot Camp by Remake Learning. Is that different thing uh, or? They're, yeah, they are a different organization. Remake Learning is, I'm trying to remember where they're out of. I know them. Um, I want to say they're out of D.C. maybe. Okay. Uh, but they're, they're a foundation, a nonprofit that they are very much in the, they're a little more in the um, kind of, I would, I would say, theoretical research realm where we're, <laughs> we're a little bit more of the boots on the ground, hands on, like uh, yeah. inter with teachers so yeah yeah okay yeah, yeah no we, it's it's interesting yeah 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 yep yeah. yep yeah. we've done a little bit of work with them we've done some work with uh maker ed out in the bay area um so yeah yeah it's a lot of kind of overlap between a lot of these groups so huh okay yeah yeah and, uh, go ahead uh, i was gonna say like is there so like would you say like all this, the kind of effort you mentioned, would that all be under the Maker Educator Collective or is there like a lot of other different efforts or? Yeah, so it's kind of funny because we're not a super tight organization in, in terms of like we, we get pretty nebulous. So a lot of us will break off and do other projects at the same time. It's kind of the Maker Educator Collective is more like an umbrella. Mm -hmm. Because, like, for example, this summer, um, me and Adam, who's at IU Bloomington, and uh, Casey, who's out in the Bay Area, and one of the ladies who's out in Virginia, we were participating in this thing that we called CoBuild, which was a, a research project funded by the National uh, Science Foundation uh, and Infosys Foundation, uh, where we were trying to engage families and children who were home during the, the stay at home mm. orders in maker virtual through a virtual environment. So trying to make things together. So we were developing content, um, sending those out to doing camps, all kinds of things like that in a more virtual environment to see what that looks like and to see like what the impacts are for research. Yeah. Like how yeah. can we, can we, can we kind of crack the nut to figure out what you know what what is more engaging for families to to do in the virtual environment so yeah fascinating yeah. fascinating work though yeah 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 okay i'm gonna I, so we i have a co-host caitlin okay um and i'm going to just text her real quick and see if she's uh going to join us And you're located, you said, in outside of Kansas City, yeah. Missouri. You're yeah. on the Missouri side, though, not the... Missouri side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Have you gotten a chance to see my TED Talk? I haven't watched it yet, no. I, I, I've been reading through the, the website, but I haven't okay. watched the actual TED Talk yet. So. Okay. As we wait, like, it's only four minutes. Do you want to take a look at it? Because it'll give you a lot of perspective. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Why don't you take a look it's at the it? One that's here on the on your very on the front First, page. front page yeah got it yeah yeah take a look at that um yeah, my volume isn't working <laughs> oh. 
things from tractors right up to Ms. Marchin, farmer, technologist. I was born in Poland, now in the U.S. I started a group called Open Source Ecology. We've identified the 50 most important machines that we think takes for modern life to exist. Things from tractors, bread ovens, circuit makers. Then we set up to create an open source DIY, do-it-yourself version that anyone can build and maintain at a fraction of the cost. We call this the Global Village Construction Set. So let me tell you a story. So I finished my 20s with a PhD in fusion energy and I discovered I was useless. I had no practical skills. I mean, the world presented me with options and I took them. I guess you can call it the consumer lifestyle. So I started a farm in Missouri and learned about the economics of farming. I bought a tractor, then it broke. I paid to get it repaired, then it broke again. And pretty soon I was broke too. I realized that the truly appropriate low cost tools that I needed to start a sustainable farm and settlement just didn't exist yet. I needed tools that were robust, modular, highly efficient and optimized, low cost, made from local and recycled materials that would last a lifetime, not designed for obsolescence. I found that I would have to build them myself. So I did just that and I tested them and I found that industrial productivity can be achieved on a small scale. So then I published the 3D designs, schematics, instructional videos, and budgets on a wiki. Then contributors from all over the world began showing up, prototyping new machines during dedicated project visits. So far we have prototyped eight of the 50 machines, and now the project is beginning to grow on its own. We know that open source has succeeded with tools for managing knowledge and creativity, and the same is starting to happen with hardware too. We're focusing on hardware because it is hardware that can change people's lives in such tangible material ways. If we can lower the barriers to farming, building, manufacturing, then we can unleash just massive amounts of human potential. That's not only in the developing world. Our tools are being made for the American farmer, builder, entrepreneur, maker, we've seen lots of excitement from these people who can now start a construction business, parts manufacturing, organic CSA, or just selling power back to the grid. Our goal is a repository of published design so clear, so complete that a single burned DVD is effectively a civilization starter kit. I've planted a hundred trees in a day I've pressed 5,000 bricks in one day from the dirt beneath my feet and built a tractor in six days. From what I've seen, this is only the beginning. If this idea is truly sound, then the implications are significant. A greater distribution of the means of production, environmentally sound supply chains, and a newly relevant DIY maker culture can hope to transcend artificial scarcity. We're exploring the limits of what we all can do to make a better world with open hardware technology. Thank you. It's awesome. Yeah. I, as I watched it, I realized I did watch the whole thing. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I thought I, I thought I hadn't. I thought I stopped it halfway through or something. But yeah, okay. I, I, had, I had watched it uh, all. Good, That's good. awesome. It's so cool. Yeah, that's Ooh, cool. That's what we do, and yeah, we're trying to. Right now, we're pretty much developing the revenue models around all the products. So we've done a lot of R and D to date, yeah. and now getting things out there, like starting to sell the three D printers. Next year, we want to start selling the tractors and actually producing the houses. It's going to be a that's big awesome. initiative next year. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, so I haven't heard back from from Caitlin. So I say let's just jump in. Let's yeah. let's get started. So we'll okay. start by just having you say your first and last name. Okay, Marcin Jakubowski. All right, Marcin. So let's jump in here. You are the founder and the creator of something called Open Source Ecology. Can you maybe tell us the story that that you talk about in your TED Talk of of how you came to this whole idea? Yeah, so um, yeah, finished uh, grad school with a PhD in plasma 
physics and I discovered I was useless. So, uh, the thing is, I was studying science and the farther I went, the, the less useful I felt. And um, what got me started on this was the idea that um, actually in a, in a graduate program, uh, I could not talk openly about my work to others. And I thought about, wow, what a great waste this is that we can't even share our work openly because we're competing with other groups for funding and disclosing our stuff would mean that someone else could take it and run with it. But when I noticed that, I started thinking about what, what true open collaboration would really look like. I couldn't find it in the grad school level, even in our public institutions. And I figured that was a persistent problem everywhere. So at one point, someone also introduced me to Linux during the open source operating system. And put, putting two and two together, I said, OK, let's start a project and try to, try to collaborate. What would life look like if we actually collaborated as the norm as opposed to the patents and secrecy and trade secrets and all that? Uh, so can we redesign a society's operating system around that? And that's that's our mission. That's incredible. So it, it, I love the, that you used the idea of uh, an operating system for civilization. Yeah, like, literally. That, uh, because that sounds like a Buckminster Fuller idea. <laughs> it is, it is. It's definitely yeah. at that scale. I mean, that's that's the kind of nature of what we talk about. But if you think about uh, what's happened with software, and software, the that's an operating system for how a lot of the infrastructure of today is working because a lot of more things are getting getting uh, electric and ele electronics and information economy. So, but at the same time, we still haven't figured out a few things like how to distribute wealth easily. There's all the institutions in the world. So beyond the world of software, the physical reality, how we produce things. Uh, unfortunately, over the last 200 years, we've had this inertia of patents and protectionism starting with the Industrial Revolution that such that when software came out and an open source software like Linux came out in the 90s, there was some culture built around that said, oh, we can collaborate openly, that open culture already existed there in some way. Whereas for hardware, we're trying to, to do it identically the same. How do you collaborate on developing the physical artifacts? Uh, not only the products like open source product development, but also how like institutions that are transparent and open and, and collaborative, which, which is definitely not the case today. And, um, in fact, uh, to the point that I mentioned the word artificial scarcity and abundance of all the resources out there, why is uh, so many people still deprived and the equality issues or resource issues, hunger, poverty, uh, war, um, that's, a, that's a systemic issue that is um, not validated by any reality such as real scarcity. There's plenty of resource, there's plenty right. of energy that comes from the sun. For any physics teacher, they will know that there's 10,000 times more power coming from the sun that we use today, even in our um, wasteful, more or less wasteful economy. Wasteful, by, by wasteful, I mean kind of throwaway society is the, how most things um, work. But yeah. even if we take that wasteful economy, which provides us abundance naturally in some way, um, there's still like 10,000 times more power that we have accessible. We're hardly scratch the surface of resource use or wise resource use. Right. So we need to think about it differently, a new operating system for how we w work on Earth in a collaborative way. And this idea then leads to this set of tools that are, are basically a way of, of reconstructing civilization, right? So, so here's the idea. So um, because there's still these massive inequalities of, of wealth between the first and third world and then a third world and a fourth world, the, the poor regions of developed countries. I mean, that's that's a blatant fault right there. I come from Poland, so I actually know the world before I came at the age of 10 it was the communist regime. And mm -hmm. It was kind of dark and gloomy and had to wait in line for food, things like that. So I was thinking, well, how do you make sure that that abundance can, can happen everywhere? When I first walk into an American grocery store with a hundred of each item, <laughs> this, this total abundance, I was like, wow, this is just amazing. How can one country be like this and another be completely deprived? Yeah. So, um, so, so I said, okay, let's start with the material abundance that get, can get us all there so that we can focus on thriving, not just making a living. Now, as, as we develop the, the Global Village Construction Set, that naturally takes a development process, a collaborative development process. So as we develop the tool set, we're developing the methodology for working collaboratively, openly, in an open source, modular, uh, transparent way. So there's a whole 
product development method that can be created around that. Because a lot of people right now just simply can't find the business models or, or ways to develop in a, in a collaborative way. So yes. it's the platform of how do you work openly to develop things that can be applied to anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this global village construction set that you referred to, mm -hmm. it, I, I think on your website somewhere they refer to it as sort of a industrial Lego set. Right? Yeah. Like these are the tools that you need. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you, we were going to start civilization all over again. Yeah. Yeah. So you need need to have things like a tractor and an engine. We get into the full fabrication thing. We start with three D printers, which can be used to build torch tables where the torch tables can now cut steel for your tractor. So there's whole product ecologies around that. And yeah. how do you try to do that in the most efficient way using the minimal set, in fact, to the point that you can fit all of this in a 40 foot shipping container and start a civilization from completely raw land. That's incredible. So you, you, you've developed these tools that you think are, are kind of essential tools. Um, We're 30% done. We don't have them all. We've got. Right. Uh, we've got a, about 30 or so prototypes. There's several that are products like the 3D printer, the torch table, the tractor, the house, the power cube, the brick press. They can all be productized. There's a bunch more in yeah. development. And those, you basically just share out um, ha the 3D models, the yeah. CAD yeah. files, all yeah. of those yeah. things are, are open source and available to folks. Yep. Download free CAD. We also have OSE Linux, our dedicated distribution. You can download all the blueprints for... for uh, so over the last since the last three years, we've been using FreeCAD, the open source CAD design software. Since that got really good enough to to do anything, that's so we do yeah. everything in FreeCAD. So you can also have anybody collaborate on this. Nobody, no paywall for this tool. Yeah, yeah. I'm interested in in your TED talk. There, it looks as though you invite people to yeah. the farm, Indeed. Um, yeah, and spend time. Um, building together, prototyping together. Can you yeah. just kind of briefly yeah. describe how that process works? Yeah, actually there's different ways. We definitely have a lot of on-site activities, but what we found is that initially I was here myself, right? And it's like labor was definitely a big thing. So we're thinking about how do you do this really efficiently? Uh, well, you saw me in my TED talk. I said, built a tractor in six days. <laughs> well, right now we can do that in a single day. And how do you do that? swarm building so basically collaborative design based on module based design where you build all the modules individually and if you know the interface design between them you can assemble them rapidly into place to get things like the tractor or the brick press built in a single day which we've done or a house with 50 people the house i'm living in right now uh, 1400 square feet five days with 50 people so we design what we call extreme manufacturing. It's a swarm build social production model that we think can apply to just about anything. And we're really going forward with it as a, as a revenue model, uh, as a viable way to build things. Now, right now you can learn some of this thing. We have actually summers of extreme design build. We still have the various workshops where we teach people how to do that. And actually the latest addition to our, our set of how we, how we try to, transfer this knowledge to others is actually a one year immer a mentorship immersion program where we teach you all the skills we know so you can start a chapter of our work in a different location so we're just actually starting our first one ever in South Africa with a great That's candidate fun. who's gonna spend the ne actually next two years at 50 percent time learning all the skills to replicate so they could run the workshops there they could build the 3d printers from scratch and torch tables and tractors and everything and interestingly so well just let me just finish that that yeah, story yeah. Um, the guy there he's there, there it's like all mining country where they mine chromium so he actually wants to build the heavy machines and tractors so for a mining operation which actually has done before with limited success because he learned the hard way that you need these heavy machines that you don't have access to and cost a lot and break down so perfect match that's incredible yeah that is incredible so will he come to you and not right now of course with covid but yeah. uh yes he will for all the on-site events once they start going so part of the program is that you get get to come to all the other workshops and immersion trainings that we have but right for right now it's gonna to have to be remote and we can do all the CAD work he can source the like for example he's building the printer he's sourcing we already figured out you can source all the parts in South Africa so that uh, he can do that and bootstrap from there and eventually of course get to the bootstrapping aspect where 
Uh, some of the more advanced tools are induction furnaces and hot metal rolling. So if you have a waste stream of metal, you can make your own virgin steel. How would you like that? <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. It is incredible. So what's the plan? What's the plan for that program? I, I mean, it, I guess maybe this is more of a kind of future casting of what that program looks mm -hmm. like. Are you looking to develop the like small satellites? Absolutely. Kind of Absolutely. Uh, that's definitely on the plan. Like till 2028, we're that's our deadline for finishing all the different tools, the, all the 50 machines. So you can you can start a ready micro factory or even the whole community from scratch just like that. Uh, but as far as the uh, the replication of different branch facilities, yes, we call that the OSE um, camp. We call it the OSE campus. Mm -hmm. So it's a facility that has education. You have living. You have production. You have agriculture. So like a real settlement, like a kind of like a mix of a university and eco industrial park, a real cookie cutter development. Uh, yeah. You know, different aspects and a, and a farm and all of that. Put those into one. Uh, but focus around the education part. So there we educate people to work very explicitly on solving pressing world issues. Yeah. And we distribute these facilities all over the world. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing large numbers of these basically seeing, seeing points of light that work in each local community um, distributing the economy. I mean, w this is the big game of can we finally master the distribution aspect of the economy? Can we get past the kinds of pickles we're seeing right now with COVID, with the supply chains and yeah. all of that, and reskill people and and close the divide between the the Republicans and liberals and all that, uh, yeah. get people productive and focusing on s solutions to pressing world issues rather than self-interest. That's great. Yeah, you're not swinging at small small things here. You're you're kind of swinging for the fences, right? We're swinging <laughs> a big hammer. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's incredible. So you yeah. mentioned you mentioned education, and before we actually yeah. started, uh, kind of the recording, we were just chatting, mm -hmm. um, and so I know that one of your interests is in in trying to develop this for younger people as yeah. well. Can you tell us a little bit about that, also. Right now, we are, we are running open source micro factory steam camps where we learn a lot of very practical skills so we're, and we're trying to do it in a way that's really generative as in like this is not just a steam camp where you, you do this for education but things that can serve education but are scalable and modular to the point they can build them up for real industrial productivity so we start uh, the, the micro factory steam camp we're actually running one next month which we're actually publishing this weekend or tomorrow yep. but you're going to build your own 3d printer from scratch build your own micro arduino like microcontroller from scratch build a 3d printed electric motor learn keycad learn collaborative design using freecad so basically really practical applied skills that you can design the things then print them and so forth yep. and then i'm assuming that that those skills kind of scaffold up right so once you've built the microcontroller and the 3d printer then you can build up from there to yeah abso absolutely yeah. so for example the Part of the motivation behind the, the microcontroller is, okay, can we take that microcontroller developed to the point where we're using that one in our 3D printers? Mm -hmm. Or the 3D printer produces larger, we call this the universal axis CNC system, basically uh, precision controlled axes that are controlled by the Arduinos. But you can print the 3D printed components of that with the 3D printer so you can build a much larger torch table that's like 5 by 10 feet. So boot, bootstrapping literally from the smallest machines to the larger ones. And make your shredder blades for the plastic shredder that you can then do the recycling of plastic. So that's part of the game there. Uh, but yeah, whole product ecologies, uh, industrial ecologies of open source uh, circular economies. Yeah, that's how I, the circularness of that was what I was going to comment on is, yeah. is it sounds like a lot of thought is b being put into creating all of this I into a circular absolutely economy, absolutely right? you got to be able to go down to the land like in fact our promise is that with the whole global village construction set you can literally take the the rocks sunlight plants soil water and make metals your life stuff of modern civilization your furniture your plastic your everything that you use um, yeah. The most advanced, like in the set itself, we actually have aluminum extraction from clay. Now, clay, aluminosilicate is, uh, sil uh, aluminum is one of the most abundant elements 
it's like number four I think is it mm -hmm. uh, in Earth's crust but how about if you can smell that from clay so you can not only make bricks from your compressed earth block press but also aluminum <laughs> if you have some electricity yes you can do that so this is the radical step of saying okay literally from the dirt and twigs under your feet you can bootstrap modern civilization our experiment is indeed that like take any parcel like our 30 acres here and show that you can do that and have a completely regenerative system that makes it go yeah yeah so I, I am guessing that that this sounds like a lot of work for one person <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right yeah <laughs> Uh, do you have a team behind you of, of folks that is kind of collaborating with you on developing these things out? Yeah, we have uh, we have a volunteer team. There's, that's a huge challenge. Right now we have volunteers. Uh, we have about four full-time equivalent of all the different people that are working on the project in little bits. I'm on this full-time. But that's one part that we're really trying to develop right now. It's really about jobs. Like one of the... One of the things we found out is the high turnover, you, you have to get to the point where you're developing the products and revenue streams from that. So it's a real source of livelihood. And that's basically where we are. So we're focusing a lot on the enterprise aspects and training people to do this for a living. So yeah. we're working on that part. But as far as, um, you know, I kind of, I must say, like building a team, uh, about last year I came through a realization. It's like, wow, I, I have a mentor, a really good mentor who, I talked to him about this and, and and he said collaborative design well where's your team because I, I mentioned to him it's like okay well you know people just come and go in, in open source it's like you got these wild cats that you're herding uh, so but then it made me think and and I really started to look deeper how do we get to these much larger collaborative um, events and endeavors that result in real products not just the fact oh yeah you, you prototype and it's like the thing you have to recognize that it's not like one two or three prototypes it's like a dozen or a hundred prototypes you have to go through to make something really good and that uh, the open hardware world has a real issue with that and also a lot of people who do get products they end up closing them up or otherwise making them inaccessible so that's a real challenge so so right now we're thinking about actually we're working on it with a mind shift I basically said no I don't have to do that it's myself no it's not at all think hard about how we involve others to do this so through this mental shift uh, the latest thing we're gonna try is basically a, a three-day somewhat like a hackathon but where we take the existing seed eco home that we have and get like our goal right now is 2,000 people three-day weekend like an extreme enterprise event we actually call that extreme enterprise where we document everything that's needed to start a business producing these houses so go through even like making a website uh, doing all the legal stuff like how do you get the code um, you know the code uh, say inspection schedule all the bills and materials and business plans and all that so 2,000 people imagine we could do that but but definitely the house is something that a lot of people like so we're promising, and we think we can do this uh, technologically, not an issue, $50,000 for a thousand square foot house that you and a friend could build in one week. There's a, tr there's, a, there's a catch, you have to build them. So we build, as I mentioned, using the, the modular building technique. Yeah. Uh, so the house that I live in right here, like you don't see this because the walls are covered, but we build it by building four by eight modules that are then rapidly assembled into the finished house. That's why we can do that in five days with 50 people. But we built all the four by eight panels in the shop and then brought them up here. And then you've got some other elements like the roof and floor and stuff. But th um, with the house project, we're saying that, okay, every weekend uh, spend like four hours building a couple modules. Yeah. Get a friend. You You have to actually build four modules per weekend, which is... Each mm -hmm. module takes like two hours. Okay. But if you can afford eight hours single, or you know four hours, two people, or like two hours with four people, then you can do this. You stash all your modules and then get your friend for one week and you just build it out. So that's the idea. And we're using heel. I don't know if you know anything about construction, but helical pier foundation is a very efficient way to get past the troubles of of concrete foundations. And actually, okay. these helical piers, these piles that you screw into the ground that serve mm -hmm. as a foundation, it's like one of the most advanced things you can do. It only came out in a, like 
about 90s or two 90s first they started being used in residential construction in a heavy scale like right now they're getting more and more popular because of their advantages you can build them really fast you can put them all yeah. out in in one day so and, it, uh, it, you don't need a concrete no, uh, slab no. no no this is piles they go it's like seven ten feet 14 even more wow. sometimes but uh, you screw them in with an auger and yeah. they each of them holds like 20,000 pounds you know and you have enough of them for a house but yeah yeah that's exactly what we're planning so our house the thousand square footer would be 27 of these and that's a job that a contractor can do in a day so we hire that out 5k and uh, go from there that's awesome so you're inviting people this extreme event uh, what would you call it extreme yeah it's called extreme enterprise enterprise yeah so you're gonna have people come there and and just do that for because of COVID, it's still the it's gonna be a three-day remote thing we're planning yeah. that we're we're assuming that august 2021 that's when it's going to happen it's still we're going to be locked down in some way probably so yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we are going to offer after that a one week immersion where we build that out in completion and the yeah. people who sign up for this program they they get first in line for their house for 50k total uh we get a service fee out of that even and then um they they get training like it's a seven or eight day immersion where you build every single type of module that goes into this house um and then you can actually we're going to run this for like five months straight like twice a month so yeah. people can come back if they feel they didn't learn it they can come back but we're trying to say okay give, give people all the support all the resources and solve the housing problem let's do that yeah. so and that that was going to be my follow-up question there is that the the hope for this i guess the the, the idea is that these folks will then go out, spread that out, and begin seeding that wherever they are coming from. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, we're being very deliberate about it in a 2,000 person program, and we'll see if we can do that. It's not going to be easy, but we're slating 100 to be entrepreneurs. We're going to focus specifically on entrepreneurs, 100 of them who actually have a six month immersion training after. So it's, it's like that's only the beginning, but they would be going in for an immersion training thereafter and also also with the intent of starting up what I mentioned about the OSE chapters or the, uh -huh. the, the OSE campuses in different places yes to do exactly that so some people might do this and then you know they lose their relationship to OSE or whatever do that independently or they work deliberately with us on, on the whole big picture thing yeah that's what we want to see that's incredible because it's open source that's how we can change the world that's, this is this can be big, so we'll see what happens. Well, now, because you, I know that you have to be paying attention to, to things like this. Uh, do you see gl globally, like, I, obviously, since the 90s, like, I think I became aware of, of open source ideas probably in a sa similar way as you through Linux and these open source um, software kinds of, of things. Do you see as you're getting in deeper and deeper in this, do you feel like the, the open source thing, generally speaking, ha is, I feel like there's always that tension, but do you feel like um, the open source movement has, is growing momentum um, over time? I guess, does, it, does that make sense to you? It does, no, it's terrible. It's in the dark ages, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, there were some events like I would say 2012, 2011 may have been the heyday of of open source, where there was an open source project around every corner. Uh, about 2012 or so, there were some events at 2012 or 2013. The MakerBot enclosure, mm -hmm. you you know about that? Mm -hmm. The enclosure of MakerBot kind of gave the whole world the message, including the VCs in Silicon Valley, that once you get serious, you gotta go proprietary. Yeah. So. Right now, we are in the dark ages. Uh, some open source companies have shut down recently or sold out. Uh, Prusa 3D printers is the biggest 3D printer company in the world right now in terms of numbers of printers, so that's still good. Yeah. I don't think they're open source centric, like in that sense of that word. Uh, yeah. They're just selling printers, I would say. But to, to be, you know, to critique that issue, uh, there's not a great example where you see open source collaborative development resulting in real business cases. Like take 
Lulzbot, take Prusa, take Ultimaker. Well, yes, but they're not going that next step, which is how do you get a lot of entrepreneurs doing the same thing? If it's an open open uh, technology, why do not we make the, the business model also open? So that's exactly what we're doing. We're calling that distributive enterprise. We're saying we will teach you to build our printers, go into business, make them in, Af in South Africa uh, for our guy, everywhere around the world so that you can completely distribute the, the wealth. So, so Lulzbot, Ultimaker and Prusa are still, they're still actually centralized operations. So they're, yeah. they're not delivering that distribution of economic power. That's the promise of the, the I, in my view, the, the unreached promise of open source hardware. That has yeah. not happened. And people are not aware of that. So that's why we're saying that, okay, let's do this enterprise event, the extreme enterprise thing with the house and show mm -hmm. we're taking this open blueprint and we're productizing it. And we get yeah. enough people to succeed at that development process. Because the problem we're solving for, and uh, really when I think about the open source hardware thing, for people showing up so that enough people show up so that completion actually happens. That completion step is really elusive. I yeah. mentioned it takes a lot of effort to make it happen. If you look at the metaphor of software, I think it's actually quite valid. Think about how many bugs people go through before a piece of code is released. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, the I think from my experience, the same metaphor applies to hardware. You can improve something, but you can Im keep improving, keep streamlining, keep streamlining the production engineering. Like I thought I was done with the printer. Now we made it even simpler. We made this change and this other change. And, and these are not trivial changes. I think altogether they make them towards the point where you have a superior product. It's just really good. But you have to go through that. You have to go through so many iterations that it's just super expensive. Yeah. yeah. So I love that idea that that for using Prusa as the example that yes, you might be able to get the the hardware, the technology on an open source platform, but Prusa isn't going to tell you how to build the Prusa company. Exactly. <laughs> And that's, that's what you're doing. That's, that's the, that's the additional step that, you, that you're taking, which I think is incredible. Exactly. And I think very few, I'm glad you, you relate to this, this issue. I think very few people understand that point. Yeah. The idea that, okay, there's an open technology, but what if we tweak that to that next phase? Is there even a next phase? Yes, there is. It's called yeah, economic distribution. Yeah. Solving the, pro the issue the, the, of wealth disparity that has not been solved since the 1300s. <laughs> since no. double, book, uh, double entry accounting has been invented. <laughs> this is incredible. Um, so I, I want to be w aware of your time and, and not, not keep you over, overly long, but this yeah. is fascinating. Yeah, it is. Um, it is. So could, could you maybe... Um, Give us, give us your like next ten years. So you said twenty twenty eight is the finish of the fifty products, the yep. your your giant Lego set. Mm -hmm. um, what does the next ten years look like in terms of where you're heading? Like, what would you like to see? But where do you think that that you're more realistically going? Yeah, uh, I mean, definitely the twenty twenty eight cutoff on the entire set and things going well i mean our budgets i mean we've had a basically a shoestring budget the whole time but i think with a house project next year uh we're aiming for the millions per year level next year uh if we achieve that that would be amazing i think it, in my rough estimate it will take like 10 million to finish the entire set we're only like 1.5 million over the last decade it's like shoestring so uh, there's revenue that has to start getting generated from the products. So we're starting the chapters. So the ideal view in 10 years, we've got a few chapters that are actively developing. 2028, we have completed the set that we actually start massive replication of the, of the work to the point of creating education facilities that have a robust business model with them. And, and at that same time, within the next 10 years, microfactory in thousands of cities. 
a micro factory that you, where you're producing cars, you're producing uh, cell phones, you're producing uh, CNC machines, energy equipment, and all of that. Uh, like a small facility in every basically think about like Walmart except you actually have production there and you can buy either the product or the production of that product if you want to become an entrepreneur so uh, so next year like if the housing project works we could we'd like to say we have dented the housing issue but the real frontier is to see if that works and if that method of of the large swarm development really works I think it can by how much we've learned about modular design and um, basically the modularity. Uh, just like Linux is broken down into many, many thing, many little modules, you can do I the identical thing with, with hardware, and then you can allocate a team, a collaboration architecture of people to solve all those problems. We think that's quite doable and agile and uh, standard op product development techniques, I think, are there. But if we can succeed in that, then we literally aim, like within 10 years, to put on the map the notion that we're shifting the economy from proprietary to collaborative. Meaning that if you're a big corporation, you're doing what Linux does. You go into a common repository of open design, and that's what you're producing from. As a, as a result, and better than software probably, because software, I mean, you, you still get the, the conglomerates in software, like Facebook or Amazon. Mm. Yeah. Um, for hardware, we're actually hoping for much higher level of distribution so that if you can succeed in a micro factory, it's not going to be the Amazon micro factory. It's going to be an, uh, a personal micro factory run by many, many agents through the distributive enterprise model. I do think that the future of Amazon will also be on demand production, clearly. I mean, technology is getting better. We want to do better for the environment. We want to do better for people and the economy. I think it's clearly inevitable that. That the something in the nature of the open source micro factory of distributed production, downloadable plans, distributed production through open source advanced machinery, that's going to be the norm. I mean, we can go to the stars. We can do this. So yes. that's that's what that's what I envision. And and when I when I think about this, the the mission is collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. Ah. Our goal is to shift the economic paradigm. So as I as I mentioned, the patents, the patent thing, it just goes out of style. Like what for? Why, why slow down innovation when you can unleash it? So right now, I believe we're in a stone age of innovation. If we really want to solve problems, we got to learn to collaborate. Like okay, just, just to give you an example. Um, so next year we're saying ah, we're going to solve the housing issue. Okay, <laughs> two years from now, we're going to solve the energy issue. That's how we got to think. Yeah. And for example. Just with solar hydrogen running in internal combustion engines, I think you can solve that issue. Like, for example, with a, we're on off-grid PV here, but we've got a system that's got one to two cents per kilowatt hour energy production cost, mm -hmm. which if you do the math translates to 66 cents per kilogram equivalent hydrogen production from electrolysis. Well put that two and two together and a, and a compressor and you've got fuel that's less than a dollar a gallon because one one kilogram of, of hydrogen is a gallon of gasoline that kind of stuff is possible today in internal combustion engines you don't even need fuel cells yeah so that we have to think like that that's a what i just said is i, I don't think there's any technical uh, challenge to that it's just a challenge of people's consciousness of whether that's possible and of course your companies are not going to do that today yeah. that would disrupt the world order but yeah. i think that's that's how we got to think and we got to say okay next year's uh, extreme uh, enterprise challenge we're going to do the open source hydrogen car or whatever uh, stuff like that so i i'm envision these kinds of things happening as the the no, the new norm we're going to say we've got problems let's solve them let's just collaborate but it takes it takes that mind shift. So that's the hard thing. There's not going to be a free lunch here. We're going to have to teach people how yeah. to collaborate, and that's what we do. Absolutely, Martin. That's that's incredible. This has been this has been a fascinating conversation. I thank you so much for yeah. your time. Yeah, absolutely. And if people want to get involved, like if mm -hmm. people listen to the podcast and and they want to they they get lit up, 
how, how can they find out more information and get in contact and things like that? Yeah, we have a good getting involved page on the wiki. I can send you that link. Okay. Uh, take a look at the TED Talk first. Then uh, join the dev team, buy our printers, sign up for our workshops. If you really want to go the deep, the deep end and get, uh, we're doing the, as I mentioned, the one year fellowship, the immersion, immersion training. So if you <laughs> want to do this, we want to teach you all the business know-how, all the technology know-how. So this is for real. This is about really distributing economic power to everybody. And so if you want to sign up for that, um, email me. Awesome. And that's opensourceecology.org is where they can start mm -hmm. getting, mm -hmm. getting involved. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Absolutely. Good talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's great. Uh, I'll wrap it up there and I'll edit everything uh, back together. Um, I'll share my recording with you if you don't mind uh, sharing yours. I will. Um, I'm a little worried about my computer. I'm using my really old MacBook. It, it's been a great uh, workhorse for me, but it's... it's yeah. It's, I'll, uh, I'll yeah. post this to YouTube so you can just download it um, right. readily after this. Yeah, no, that's... Uh, you asked some good questions. You're... Uh, that was quite quite useful uh-huh yeah, yeah so yeah. I was able to share some of the the latest stuff but yeah it's about like that kind of a process that's that's what we're trying to say like okay take all the classrooms right so we call that the open source ecology classroom where you're simply saying hey um, let's not just do this exercise or this or that or first robotics where we're all competing let's first of all pick something all work on it together and learn how to collaborate effectively on it and, I really and like that. build real things. Yeah, yeah. I like the idea of building it around a challenge because we, my my kind of issue with those first robotics and programs and and like that is it's it just seems sort of removed from anything that <laughs> yeah. I'm actually going to use the thing. Like, yeah, I can make a robot move a ball from here to okay. there. Yeah. So for a practical program. Uh, I'd invite you to do so for the the schools. Like at the mm -hmm. university level, we're actually gonna. This is after the house project, but we're going to go for the hydrogen car thing, the solar hydrogen car. Yeah. Uh, for the lower schools, what we want to do is the 3D printing, recycling of plastic, so that every cafeteria uh, starts selling its own 3D printing filament made from the trash. But if you want to get involved, I mean, we have um, we've done filament makers and shredders. Right now, we are actually doing this 10,000 fold gear down using 3D printed belts. So it's super mm -hmm. low cost, just using a 100 watt motor. I don't know if you can relate to that, but mm -hmm. that's one human power. 100 watts is one human power. So a tiny motor for five bucks, you can actually make a heavy duty shredder if you if you gear that down. Ah. Yeah, I love that. It'll be that slow, idea. it'll be slow, but yeah, I yeah. mean, just leave it all overnight, put the stuff in a hopper yeah. and it just chews it up. I mean, we're talking about I think 200, uh, I forget the exact units, 200 kilogram meters, like ridiculous, like strength of almost pretty much like a hydraulic motor strength. Yeah. Uh, after you gear it down that many times. But, and it's 3D printed. So, like, I, I prototyped this. Uh, you'll see this in an announcement. I'll, I'll send you the announcement for the event. Yeah. yeah it would be great if you can pass it and we get some people Absolutely. to sign up. But um, we'll be playing with that at least somewhat um, through the Steam Camp. So, you can do that. But yeah, I, I've done that. It's uh, TPU, th thermoplastic urethane, printed belts. Very amazing. Yeah. Like you can do these amazing gear downs at a very low cost. That is super cool. Hey, yeah. March, this was awesome. awesome. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Okay. All right. We'll Thank see you. ya. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.
Captain. Marchant, got it. Marchant, how are you? Doing well. Uh, do you mind if I record this also just for my notes? Not at all. Awesome. Yeah, actually that might... Uh